So awesome, man. Chris, thanks for sharing your story with us, and thanks for allowing us in on this and getting to celebrate your walk with Christ, and you're wanting to live in obedience and take this next step of publicly saying, man, I'm in. Christ has changed my life, and I am following him. Um, so thanks. We celebrate with you, man. Way to go. Well, welcome once again to Northridge. Welcome, everybody. However, wherever you might be joining us, we are so honored that you're with us uh, today. Welcome, Rochester. Welcome, our online campus. Shout out to everyone in Webster. Ha- hope you're having an awesome morning so far. Those that don't know me, my name is Nate, and I have the privilege of serving as uh, the campus pastor in Webster. So excited to have a chance to get to speak um, here today. And, you know, this time of year, is always a a time of the year that takes me back to when I was a kid. You see, around this time would be one of my most favorite times of the year as a kid because I would be counting down the days to summer, right? Counting down the days of just a couple more days left of class, a couple more days of this teacher that's always on my back because I can't get my homework assignments done or because my misbehaving in class, right? We all a couple more days until freedom and enjoyment of summer because sun, uh, summer to me was this window of freedom and fun. It was this window of me and my buddies cruising the neighborhood and we would head down to the ball fields and play baseball or we would ride our bikes around or we would play street hockey. It was this beautiful, awesome moment, this window of fun. And just as much as I looked forward to summer, I equally dreaded September (laughs) because September meant the end of this window of fun and freedom and enjoyment. And similarly, as we've been working our way through the book of Revelation, we've been talking about this window that is open. We've called it a window of mercy, a window of grace, where there's this invitation to put our faith and trust in Jesus, that God has yet to fully unveil his wrath on evil. And so there's this moment, this window is open. But as we're going to see today in our study in Revelation, we're going to find that the window comes to a close today. A window of mercy ends today. We're going to pick it up right where we left off last week in the middle of Revelation 19. And just to give a brief review of kind of where we have been at, we've kind of broken the book of Revelation down into three major sections. Chapters 1 through 5 is all about the revelation of Christ. Chapter 6 through 19, verse 10, is the judgment of God. And we've been in that section for a while. In fact, Drew last week just finished this section Uh, in the book of Revelation, the judgment of God. And now today we are entering the third and final section of the book. Today and next week are all about the glory of heaven. And today as we're gonna see, we start in verse 11 of chapter 19, we are going to see the battle of Armageddon, the return of Christ. And for some of you, when you hear me say the battle of Armageddon, your mind immediately transports you to 1998 and Bruce Willis and the movie Armageddon. Right? And that movie was based off of the events in Revelation 19 that we're going to, I'm just kidding. That, that movie had nothing, <laughs> has nothing to do with the Bible. So whatever you think about Armageddon in the Bible, like erase that from your mind. Bruce Willis, no, that, that movie has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today. But we've been building to this moment and we've been building to this moment for eight weeks 19 chapters, and perhaps for some of you, when you heard we were doing this series on Revelation, you were like, man, the second coming of Christ, the battle of Armageddon, like, I'm I'm so excited for this moment, you've been waiting eight weeks, well, here you go, today we are going to look at it and uncover it together, and you can go ahead, actually, in your Bibles, go ahead and turn there, have a copy of God's Word in front of you, however you access it, whether it's a digitally or a physical copy, if you're using one of our Bibles at Northridge, one of our campuses, you can find that on page 1000. And three. So we've been building to this moment, and last week Drew finished this section on the judgment of God right up to verse 10 of chapter 19. And a brief recap remember last week we talked about how uh, the city of Babylon. Was, was dealt with and destroyed. This world system that would point and pull people away from God has been dealt with. And then we also saw the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's verses 9 and 10 of where we, the bride of Christ, are realizing Christ is returning in this moment of the groom finally coming for the bride of Christ, which is the church. And there's this feast and celebration, the wedding supper of the Lamb that Jesus is returning. And so there's this celebration, but then all of a sudden, the scene changes. And in verse 11, we see one of the most incredible images of Jesus, I believe, in all of the Bible. Verse 11, it reads like this, I saw heaven standing open, 
And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. So a couple of things here. Maybe even as I read that, something tripped in your mind as like, wait, a white horse and a rider, that sounds familiar to me. And that's, that's good because you're right. There was a white horse and a rider that we saw in Revelation chapter six, verse two. Remember the first of the seven seals? But that was an imposter. It was a fake Christ. It wasn't the one true uh, king. And that's who is here. That's who we're looking at here. And look at the description of this rider who is Jesus. It says Jesus is called faithful and true. Those two words are very important. We shouldn't just brush right by those. That Jesus is described as faithful and true. And this is such good news. Wherever you are coming at in your journey of faith today, you got to know Jesus is faithful. He never compromises. He's never made a mistake. He's never stumbled. He has never fallen, unlike so many other people all throughout history. He hasn't fallen like the leaders in the Old Testament fell. He hasn't fallen like leaders in the New Testament or in the church age all the way up until this moment have fallen. No, he never has. He's unlike any other leader because he's faithful. But he's also called true. There's no shadow in Jesus, no misunderstanding in Jesus. He'll never be untrue, insincere, or deceitful. He's never gonna exaggerate or give in to half-truths. And in the end, he will not remain silent in the face of injustice. Why? Because he's faithful and true. But notice, what does John also tell us about Jesus in his coming? He's saying, with justice, he judges and wages war. Those are some pretty powerful statements of of Jesus. And remember, this is the same Jesus that said, let the little children come to me. This is the same Jesus that, that said, blessed are the peacemakers, As the famous Ricky Bobby would say, this is sweet nine pound baby Jesus in fleece diapers, right? This this is Jesus. The first time he came, it came to forgive. Well, now he is coming to judge and to wage war against all evil. And this is so important to us. And we keep coming back to this in the series. We have to have this full and complete understanding of who God is. That yes, he is loving, but yet he is also holy at the very same time. And this is important to us in the cultural moment and world in which we live where love is kind of just reduced down to whatever you think or feel it is. Just be your true self, be your authentic self and whatever you feel, that's right. And the reality is we can live that way and think God is okay with it, but the reality is he isn't. And you're living in an unholy way. And think God is just fine when in reality he's not. And the reason he isn't is because he's holy. David Wells, I love this in his book, he said, worldliness is whatever makes righteousness look strange and sin look normal. See, without God's holiness, we're gonna gloss over things, remove things, not care about justice or wrath or things like that, but the the opposite is also true, right? If God was only holy, Well, then we have a problem. There's a big problem because that means then none of us have a shot. There's no connection with God. There's no salvation. There's no second chances, which is why it's amazing that God is love and holy at the same time. And the implications of all of this is we are in this window of mercy, this window of grace right now. There's this invitation of welcome home. Welcome to the family of God. Become a child of God. Embrace who Jesus is, which is God's demonstration, God's picture of his love for us, Jesus and the cross. That despite our rebellion and sin, Jesus took our place, allows us to come home, to be called a child of God, a friend again, to be family of God that Jesus on the cross took the wrath of God upon himself so that both the justice of God and mercy are fulfilled and expressed. So we're in this invitation of welcome home, window of mercy, but this window is now coming to a close. It's coming to a close. Jesus is coming to judge and to wage war. And then verse 12, his eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has the name written on him that no one knows but himself. Again, John is using language and descriptors here that he has already talked about earlier in the book of Revelation. Eyes like blazing fire. It means he sees everything. 
Everything is exposed to Jesus. There is no hiding from him. He has seen anything and everything every individual has done, every institution, every world leader or government. He sees through everything. There's no hiding from him. And unlike the dragon and the beast that had 10 crowns or 10 false crowns, Jesus has many crowns or all the crowns. He has full authority. And then it gets a little bit even more uncomfortable as we look at Jesus. Verse 13, he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is the word of God. Now this is a powerful image that perhaps brings some dif- discomfort, maybe you'll never look at your nativity set again <laughs> after Revelation 19. But this is Jesus, and he is coming to deal with evil in all of its forms, and he's gonna conquer all evil. But this blood on his robe, whose blood is it? Well, it's actually, it's not his, and we know this from a prophecy in Isaiah, where he prophesies about Jesus when he shows up to judge the nations, Isaiah 63, verse one. Who is this coming from Edom and Basra with this garment stained crimson? Who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I, proclaiming victory, mighty to save. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress? I've trodden the winepress alone. From the nations, no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger, trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments, and I stained all my clothing. It was for me a day of vengeance. The year for me to redeem had come. In other words, what's being said here is that when Jesus returns, again, he is going to be both warrior and redeemer. He's going to be savior and judge. And all evil, all those who follow evil as defined by God, all of that will be trampled down and overthrown in judgment. And why does Jesus have a right to do this? Look at the descriptor that John gave Jesus in verse 13. His name is the word of God. Now, that that phrase, word of God, is not the first time John Uh, has used this. John is the author of Revelation, but John also wrote the Gospel of John. And if you look at John chapter one, John talks about the word became flesh and the word dwelt among us and the word was God. He uses that same image, word of God, to describe Jesus. So the reason Jesus has this authority to judge is because he's God, He's he's the word of God. So he's coming to judge the nations, but who's gonna come with him? Well, verse 14, the armies of heaven were following him. That's us, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Again, do you see these images back to the wedding supper of the lamb? Our groom has come for his bride, the church, right? Fine linen, white and clean, right? Images of a, of a wedding. Verse 15, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Again, he's pointing back to Isaiah and he's pointing back to this description of Jesus he's used before of out of his mouth is a sharp sword. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The thigh, that's a symbol of power, of strength. And on it um, is this title or this description of he's the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's above every leader, every person. Every person will face Jesus. Why? because he is king of kings and lord of lords. Who's gonna face Jesus? Buddha, Muhammad, Gandhi, Napoleon, Hitler, Putin, Trump, Biden, Einstein, Lincoln, Moses, David, Solomon, myself, you, all of us are going to face one person in the end, and who is that? It's King Jesus. King Jesus. Verse 17, and I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. See another feast here. It's interesting, another meal, right? The first one, wedding supper of the lamb in verse nine was one of celebration. This is a different feast. This is one of devastation. Verse 19, then I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist and his empire and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. 
You know, ever since I was little, um, my journey of following Christ started early. I envisioned what this moment would, would be like, Battle of Armageddon. And, and I had in my mind this picture of like, man, I probably got like camouflage on and I got like face paint on and like I'm ready to go. We were just at the wedding supper of the lamb. Now we're on, I'm on a white horse following the king of kings and the lord of lords and he's got eyes like fire and he's got a sword coming out of his, his mouth and I'm like, all right, like let's go. Let's wage war with King Jesus. Like let's go, right? I'm a competitive person. Anyone with me? Like let's go. This would be awesome. And as I was studying for this message and preparing for it, I began to realize we don't get to do anything. (laughs) Jesus just breathes and the battle is over in one moment. 2 Thessalonians 2.8, and when the lawless one is revealed, that's the Antichrist whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. That's how powerful Jesus is. Just the splendor of his coming, the breath of his mouth, Evil is dealt with. But I gotta be honest, I'm a little frustrated though. Man, I wanted to put a boot in the face of Satan. Come on, I wanted to like square up on the enemy and get a couple of blows in at least, right? For all the hell that he has brought into my life and the people around me. Man, I wanna get up off my horse and leg sweep somebody. Like, come on. Like, let's go. But in this moment, Jesus breathes on them and it's over. And the 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 Antichrist, the false prophet, they're thrown into the lake of fire. And look, you gotta understand something here that this lake of fire, it's not a moment of annihilation. This this is a moment of finalization. It's a place of eternal separation, of torment, of which I say with the deepest level of compassion will be the beginning of millions upon millions of people that follow in after them that have said no to Jesus. Which is why I say on a stage and we regularly say on the stage here and beg you to put your trust in Jesus. Be on the right side of this story. And then verse 21, it it comes to an end. It says, the rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. And just like that, that's how it ends. That's how the battle of Armageddon goes down. And Jesus just does this right here, and you know, it's over. And it it can be so easy to get in, caught up with the symbols and the signs and the timing of everything here, which are important, which we should lean into and seek to understand. But if, if we're not careful, we're going to miss some of the most important things I, I want us to remember in our minds when we think about the second coming of Jesus and the battle of Armageddon that will one day happen. A couple of word pictures. I just want, want you to remember that the first time Jesus came, he came on a donkey. The second time he comes, he's coming on a white horse. The first time he came, he came as a suffering servant. The second time he comes, he is coming as the king of kings and the lord of lords. The first time he came, he came in humility and and meekness. The second time he comes, he is coming in majesty and power. The first time he came, he came to seek and save the lost. The second time he comes, he's coming to judge and to wage war on all evil. Jesus is coming again someday. And now we arrive at one of the most difficult, one of the most debated parts in this entire letter in the book of Revelation. And it revolves around something called the millennium. Um, Now don't think year 2000. Think think thousand years when you hear the word millennium. And I just wanna say as we get going here, don't miss the forest from the trees here. This is all given to inspire hope. So what I wanna do is I I wanna read through this text together and then I wanna try to explain it and explain it in a way that hopefully provides clarity and is helpful to us. So verse one of chapter 20. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark. On their foreheads or their hands, they they came to life 
and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. All right, so what does all of this mean? Well, there are really three major views in theology on the millennium. I'll give them to you first, and then we'll define them. The first one would be amillennialism, the second would be premillennialism, and the, the third would be postmillennialism. And some of you right now are like, millennial what? Like, wow, that, that's a lot. I, I get it. So let's talk about each of these very briefly. The first view on this thousand year period and this chunk of, of scripture here in Revelation 20 would be amillennialism. People who hold to this view would say that there is no literal thousand years. That this, this thousand years is, is metaphorical. It's not, it's not a literal thousand year period. In fact, they would say we are in the thousand year period right now. That Christ, when he died and was buried and rose again and then ascended into heaven, when he ascended and the church age started, that is when the millennial period um, began. So when you think, ah, millennial, just think it's not a literal thousand years. The next view would be pre-millennialism. This would be the view that Jesus returns before this thousand years. That Jesus, along with his bride, the church, returns just like we read about in Revelation 19 and defeats evil, uh, chains up Satan, and then rules and reigns on the earth for a thousand years, and we get to rule and reign with him. And I'm out of a job during that thousand years. I'm, I'm now no longer a pastor. I'm, I'm working at like Sportsman's Warehouse or Bass Pro Shops, you know, or something like that because there's no need. We're following and ruling and reigning with King Jesus. That's a pre-millennial view that Christ's second coming initiates the thousand year period. Then there's post-millennialism that Jesus returns after the thousand years. He comes post after that thousand year period. So again, millennial, meaning a thousand years. And how, how you interpret those thousand years, that's important, it matters, but here's what we have to understand together. All three of these positions I talked about, which by the way, all agree that Jesus is coming back. Like we all agree on that. And are held by amazing men and women who love Jesus and love his holy word, love the Bible. And all of these positions date back to the early church Father. So no matter where you land on this, and for some you might be, you know what, I'm a pan-millennialist. It's just all going to pan out in the end. And so whatever happens, that, that's my view. That, that'll, be, that'll be how it goes down. I'm a pan-millennialist. That was a fun little theology joke. Sorry. That was, I had to throw in there. But wherever you land, here's what we got to under, understand. And there's really kind of just, just two thoughts as you think about the millennium that I hope we can remember. The first would just be that the best is yet to come. Right, we can agree on that. No matter how you interpret those verses, we can all agree the best is yet to come. And then secondly, which is so important, especially in light of the evil we see around us, the wars happening in Ukraine, the future is not up for grabs. It's not. Things are not spiraling out of control. It belongs to Jesus, and the future is not in our, our hands. And if you notice, all throughout the book of Revelation, hope finally breaks in from the outside. In other words, the good news is is that Satan does not have the final say. Evil does not have the final say. Nature doesn't have the final say. Mankind doesn't have the final say. No, Jesus has the last say. The future is not up for grabs. And I hope that that inspires you. I hope it provides hope to you as you think about the future. And then we get to this amazing part. After Satan's last attempt, he's released at the end of the millennium, however that goes down, he finally gets judged in verses 7 through 10. And we see the judgment of Satan. We'll just read verse 10. It says this, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I don't know about you or, or, or if you've thought much about Satan's judgment Actually, probably none of you. I'm sure none of you woke up this morning like, man, I wonder how Satan gets judged. Like, <laughs> we probably haven't had that thought, but, but hang in here with me. And I want, us, I want us to sit in this moment for a second and understand the implications of this. That Satan, that, that beautiful, powerful angel that rebelled against God and every principality and every demon that followed him and not even just that, every lie, every deception, every heresy, every evil inspired thought, anything and everything anti-God, they are done, gone and dealt with at the judgment of Satan. There will be a day when there will be no more spiritual conflict. 
whether external or internal, whether it's external and the evil and the people around us or even internal, the guilt and the shame and the fear and the anxiety that we hold on to, all of that spiritual conflict is dead and gone at the judgment of Satan. There's gonna come a day when you're no longer gonna have to put on your spiritual armor. Think of what Paul talks about in Ephesians 6 of telling us every day, put on our spiritual armor, right, to protect ourselves from the attack of the enemy, the spiritual warfare that we encounter. There's gonna come a day when you're gonna be able to take off the belt of truth, never to put it back on again. The breastplate of righteousness, you can lay it aside. The shield of faith, you can lay it down. The helmet of salvation, you can take it off, put it aside. Sword of the spirit, you can lay it down. You can put it away. There's gonna be a day we are never going to be tempted to sin ever again, right? Isn't that good news? It's incredible to think about. And we have this really powerful right, hope-inspiring image of Satan where he's thrown down and Jesus, right, in all of his glory and splendor, we know who wins the battle in the end and just before we get to the really, really good part, which is next week, so come back for that, the implications of eternity smack us right in the face in these next few verses. The, the, The reality of eternity hits right at home in the great white throne judgment. Look at verse 11. Well, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead who were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. What that means is the first death. First death is physical, right? What we see, know, and experience in in life today. The second death, that's a spiritual death. It's eternal separation from God. Separated where? Verse 15, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You see here, the great white throne judgment is all about negative judgment. It's all about negative judgment. Who's getting judged here? It's unbelievers. It's people whose names are not in the book of life. He uses the word dead to describe um, the unbelievers. And what is the judgment? Well, they're thrown into hell, the lake of fire. And who are these people? Well, actually, the next chapter, chapter 21, verse 8, gives us some descriptors of, of these people. It says the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. But it's interesting. If you go back to, to John's words there in uh, verses 11 through 15 of chapter 20, there's a book of life. And that's the names of everyone who put their faith and trust in Christ, in Jesus. And the moment you place your faith and trust in Jesus, your name is written in the book of life, sealed and forever kept so that you'd never have to appear at the great white throne judgment. And you know, as I was thinking about this message today, which is a hard and and heavy message, and thinking about like, man, how do I synthesize this down to like 140 characters for a takeaway or two? And I just kept coming back to this this reality, this takeaway of, here's what I want you to know. I want you to know this. Don't be at the great white throne judgment. Don't be there. That, that's the takeaway because here's the truth of the matter because if that's the case, there will be no one standing there with you and it will just be you alone in front of a throne. And it's not just any throne. It's the great white throne. And now you stand alone with no one around you condemned before a perfect and holy God. And perhaps in this moment you're thinking, well, man, I I did a lot of good things and I I thought that if I just lived a good life that that would be enough. God says, no, that wasn't what it was about. And yeah, I I heard about Jesus, but man, I, I didn't think he was truly God. I thought he was just a figure of culture, a figure of society, a figure in the past that told some great stories, did some good things, but he was never leader of your life. And I would imagine in this moment, the reality of Philippians 2, 9 and 10 comes through with crystal clarity. 
that therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and everyone will confess that Jesus is Lord. You see, the reality is we will all bow before King Jesus and we will all confess that he is Lord. And there will be those that do it willingly, gladly, those whose names are in the book of life. But there will also be those who go and stand before the great white throne judgment that will do that against their will, but yet they will understand in that moment that Jesus is Lord. And look, I I say this with the deepest level of compassion and sensitivity that there is a heaven, and I believe with all my heart it is worth giving your lives to Jesus for. And I also believe that the Bible teaches us that there is a hell, there is a very real place Not only is there heaven, but there is also hell. There is a real heaven and a real hell, and that's why I stand here on this stage today, and I plead with you and beg you to put your trust, not in yourself, but to put it in Jesus. We're still in a window of mercy. There's still a window of grace that is open. So don't delay. Place your trust in Christ and what he has done for you, that he took the wrath of God upon himself so that you don't have to experience the wrath of God. Don't be at the great white throne judgment. Don't be there. For those that have made that commitment, I would just urge you to do all that you can to help others not be there. That that there should be a burden in our hearts, a lump in our throat of the people around us that we know don't know Christ, of wanting to point them to Jesus. Not in a fire and brimstone condemning, judging way, but through the way that we love, through the way that we lead and serve, that we would be pointing the people around us to put their trust in Jesus so that they don't have to go before the great white throne judgment today. So be praying. Be praying for opportunities. Be praying for the people God has placed in your life. Be aware. Be open to the ways God might want to use you in all the circles. Think of all the circles that we are involved in at Northridge Church And if we had that mindset where we're regularly praying and as doors open, we invest in those relationships and through that influence and relationship, we then are able to point people and invite people to take a next step towards Christ, to ultimately place their faith and trust in Christ. We should do all that we can to help others not be there because Jesus is coming again. And we can trust and have great confidence in that. Let me close with a word of prayer. God, I thank you so much for your word, and the truth that can be found and known there. And I know today is a hard, heavy talk. It's one filled with excitement and and great, great hope for the future, but also it can be a great burden for those that we know in our lives that, that don't yet know you. We pray, God, that that day would come soon, that they would trust in you. And perhaps you're here today listening to my voice, and you're on the fence, or you've maybe never made that decision, or you're not sure if you're part of the family of God. I'd love to just speak with you, to you for a moment, with everyone's eyes closed, head bowed, that if that is you, I would invite you. There's no reason to delay, that you can step into that relationship right now through a simple prayer. It's not a magic formula. It's just you expressing in your heart to God this, that God, I recognize you love me, and yet I recognize my sin separates me from you. But yet, even though I am a sinner, you took the step of sending your son to die for my sin. God, I accept you. I accept that Christ died for me. And I ask you, God, to forgive me of my sin. Lead my life. I want to follow you. If you did that, I would just encourage you to to just share it with somebody, maybe a friend or a family member. Tell somebody You tell one of the staff members here at Northridge, we'd love to celebrate with you. It's the greatest decision you could ever make. And God, I pray for all of us, God, that this would remind us of the sober realities of the future and light a fire inside of us, God, to represent you well in a loving, gracious, but yet truthful way to point people to their greatest need, which is you. Give us the strength, God, to do that and live it out for your glory and honor, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.